Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mace. Yeah, welcome, everyone. So great to be with you all. Um, hi, friends online and folks in person. Such a delight to be able to gather and share these teachings together and really grateful for familiar faces, new faces being here to do that. I do want to say one more word about Tig's workshop. Um, for those who don't know Tig O'Malley, he's pretty, um, I'd say, unique in that he's actually a contemplative artist, and he uses art as a contemplative practice and engages us to find a kind of inner source of stillness and heartfulness through making um, creative pieces. It's quite unique. I've been to many places in the world and been fortunate to receive a lot of teachings and he has integrated such a depth of knowledge into what he's bringing. So if you have a chance, join him. Um, I think he's gonna do another if you can't make it this Sunday. So to keep that in mind. And as a welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective, just want to kind of reiterate the statement that May said that this is a volunteer run space, so precious and unique in San Francisco to have a place we can gather freely that literally exists because people care and they want you to be here. And it's such a priority for us at the San Francisco Dharma Collective to create a space where every part of what we're doing here is our practice. So of course, when we're sitting, listening to the teachings, that's the practice. But also part of the practice is how we're listening and how we're speaking to one another. And to really invite us to have mindful speech and mindful listening. None of us can know truly what is going on in each of our lives here. And we have our ideas and maybe um, assumptions, but to really keep ourselves curious and open to each one of us so that we can have a community of practice that can really support our unfolding and awakening. That's what we're here for. And it's a priority for us to learn how we can improve. We are always doing our best to create a space where people can come and feel as safe as possible in the Dharma. And if there are ways that we can improve, we would love to hear it. You can do so by um, leaving a note or talking to someone if that feels comfortable. Um, yeah, just grateful to have you all here and grateful for the kind of, um, I would say, meaningful heat that we can gather together by talking about these ancient teachings and bringing them into a contemporary context. So for those who don't know me, I'm Eve Ekman and myself and Chandra Easton share this night and have for quite a while now, a couple different centers, different locations. And we are about to start a new book, but I wasn't quite ready. I've been really inspired in the last couple of weeks to return to the teachings of the Paramitas. Um, many of you are probably familiar with these spiritual qualities. They are what we can focus on in order to help us in our awakening. Uh, there was one quote I love today that I read is, these are our, um, our transcendent virtues or transcendent qualities because they carry us across the river of confusion to the other shore. So by keeping these in mind, and so in different traditions, there's different numbers course, they're lists because it's Buddhism. We like lists. But we are going to cover six paramitas here over the next two weeks. So tonight we'll do generosity, discipline, and patience. Yes. Next week we'll do joyful effort, mindfulness, and wisdom. And yeah, I just... I just love refocusing on these. And again, for many of us here, we've looked at these qualities many times. So let's start freshly with them tonight, kind of dig into them and how they can support us. So we'll start with the meditation, probably about 25 minutes or so. Then I'll do some reflections. And I brought one of my all time favorite books, if you can't tell. Uh, we covered this in a class at the old center I think in 2019, such a beautiful book. Many of you have heard of the Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life. It's kind of one of the greatest hits of Buddhism, very commonly referred to by wonderful teachers. And this is a, a commentary by Pema Chodron on the Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life. Can't recommend this book enough. And there's a little bit of the teachings on the paramitas in here. So I'll share from that. So for our meditation, I invite you to find a posture that's supportive. If it's been a long day, maybe that posture means sitting a bit at the edge of your chair so you're less likely to fall asleep. 
For some of us, it might mean sitting cross-legged, absolutely feet on the floor, no problem. I like to invite people to remember to be generous in your clothing. So if you have restrictive clothing where it's harder to breathe at your waistline, to give yourself a little room there so we can feel our breath fully. And really give yourself a moment to find out where your neck and shoulders can be comfortable. So even sitting in a for a shorter amount of time, we can add extra strain to our neck and shoulders. So it can be really nice to play around with having our hands resting on our knees or folded in our lap and just notice how it feels in the neck and shoulders. And then giving ourselves a moment to attend a bit more deeply to our posture. So noticing how the spine is rising up from the sacrum and finding a nice upright position. Sometimes we find that balance by leaning to one side and leaning to the other and kind of leaning forward, just finding our way to that sense of balance and uprightness. Inviting there to be either a soft gaze in front of you or eyes closed, if that's comfortable. And as much as possible, invite a quality of softening, relaxing through the front of the body. Begin by feeling a sense of place for those of us gathered in the Dharma Collective, recognizing <clears throat> the space we're inhabiting, considering the thousands of years of guardianship of this space by those who came before. considering all the beings right around us, some of whom we can hear just outside the window, passing by on the street. Maybe we'll hear our neighbors upstairs. Really connecting to that sense, not only of being in our body, but of being in this place. Already the light is getting lower earlier. So having a sense of the setting sun outside. And imagining that whatever is in your practice right now, whether it's hearing the sirens or feeling some discomfort in the body, that everything here can be used as part of practice. Everything can be a way for us to come home and return to the focus of our attention. 
So let's bring our focus of attention now fully into the body. Like a water filling a vase, we pour our attention and awareness into the body. Bringing our attention to the sensations where we can really feel the body in contact with the fabric of our clothing, in contact with the air of the room. And then feeling the body from within the body. Those subtle energetic sensations, the vital energy is coursing throughout our body subtly. So we notice the sensations in the body. We do so with curiosity and with a kind of vividness. Sometimes when we close our eyes and turn inwards, we can start to feel a little dull and sleepy. Invite a sense of real vividness, clarity, curiosity to the shifting sensations throughout the body. with our body in a relative state of stillness in that we aren't going anywhere, moving anywhere. Invite that same quality of stillness to the mind. There are so many things to do and get done, but for right now, we're not doing them. So inviting our inner speech as much as possible to turn down the volume. And when a distraction arises, a thought or memory or image, it's relaxing, releasing, and returning to this close noticing 
the sensations in the body. With just the subtlest shift, invite a quality of appreciation to the noticing in the body. How truly awesome it is to be embodied. And whether we notice sensations that might feel a little dull or tight, or maybe sensations that feel warm and tingling. Just receive them, welcome them, maybe even appreciate just this tapestry of sensation through the body. Now that we've settled a bit into the body, into this place and shared space together, let's take a moment and consider the intention that brought us here this evening. Maybe the intention that brings us to practice every time. An intention is an opportunity for us to connect to what matters, what we value. And no matter what happens during practice, we get distracted over and over, we fall asleep for a moment. That intention truly makes the practice precious and invaluable. So take a couple moments and think of a word or a phrase that can really capture your intention. Letting our intention gently recede to the background, still there as a support, 
and guidance. Coming back to the body and now focusing more directly onto the breath. Noticing the breath through the rise and the fall of the belly. And considering this most simple, yet not easy instruction, breathing in, know that we are breathing in. And breathing out, know that we are breathing out. This isn't breathing in, thinking about breathing in. It's a knowing. Wow, we got Zoom bombed. It's okay. Ooh, this is really good for embodied practice though. So if you feel okay for it, just gently close your eyes. Really notice what's in the body. Notice what it's like to feel your system rise up. If that was a little activating to a level of discomfort, maybe a palm on the chest or a palm on the belly. And without a judgment of why or what's right, just notice how the body responds. Notice where you feel sensations and the type of sensations. Invite a sense of gentleness and care through the breath. And to invite that really slowing the inhale and slowing the exhale for a couple cycles of breath. And with maybe a little bit of brightness that that startle may have given to us, we can shift to a practice of labeling thoughts. This is a practice of observing and not engaging, developing our ability to notice what's coming to mind. So the thought may arise of what the hell just happened there? And label it, thinking, or past, or worry. A simple one word label, not getting too conceptual. 
returning to this anchor of the breath and waiting for what comes next. Maybe the next thought is my leg hurts. Label it pain or sensation and come back to the breath. If you get caught up in a thought and carried away, no problem. Relax, release, and return. Again, with the primary anchor, noticing the breath, and then labeling the thoughts that come, but without donating any of our energy to them. It might feel as though we're almost leaning back in our mind and observing this phenomena of thoughts and memories and images as they pass by. Maybe there are some gaps between the thoughts. 
some sense of spacious awareness in which we can experience fully the body breathing. Such a deep refreshment when our mind and body are in the same place. Such a wonderful way to recalibrate, and refresh. Feeling that sense of presence when our mind is fully following the breath, in the breath, with the breath, of the breath.
Thank you for your practice. How was eventful? That's the first time I've ever been Zoom bombed. They must have been pretty stoked. They're like, ha ha, those guys are fantastic. <laughs> oh boy. Isn't that like kind of 2020? That's like, anyway, that's anyway. Wow, expect the unexpected. So this is a bit of time to take a moment and share any reflections on that practice. Could be what was hard and annoying about being Zoom bombed. We actually, let's move on from that. Um, but anything in your practice that you noticed or any questions you had about that practice, um, that would be great to hear. What did you notice in your body after we had that experience? Was there, oh yes. And do you mind talking in that thing? That would be so awesome. Then our friends online can hear us. Geneva also had her hand up. Okay, great. And then we'll go to Geneva. Thank you. Um, so I, nothing to do with the swing bombers. <laughs> Just generally, I have a lot of, I was feeling a lot of tension in the back of my neck. Mm. And uh, what I was experiencing is just um, how much that doesn't let me breathe properly mm. at the time. Yeah. And I just felt anxiety rising and rising, mm. and not going away. Mm. So I was, until I like opened my eyes and I just looked at the floor. Yeah. And that seemed to make it better, but I wasn't sure that it's dissociating from the experience. Or... Yeah, interesting. Is that a familiar experience for you, or is that something that happened just in this practice? Uh, is this a concern that has happened when I start focusing on my body? Especially yeah. if I have the tension here, yeah. I like feel that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry to hear that. Also, that's a great strategy is looking because you're here. You know, and you could even like really like look around a little too, because sometimes when we get in that loop of that, <clears throat> whatever the difficult feeling is, yeah. um, it can really start to overwhelm as you were experiencing. And so to like be here. So another thing might just be like putting your hand on the chair, like I am here putting, did it help at all to put hands on the body? I, I didn't do that. Yeah. Also, yeah. Because I was like thinking about like, when one should engage with the thought yeah it's causing the anxiety and just be like oh either process it or like try to i mean engage in any way or which one should one just let it go and like focus on something else yeah and so was it focusing on the thoughts that was bringing up the anxiety or the tension or maybe a little bit of both tension was bringing up the, 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 the thoughts and like the, the rumination yes like, yeah. yes so i'd say in general too um and we used to do this more in the old center, um, laying down in meditation, though very risky because you might fall asleep is great. Supine practice, my, one of my like primary teachers, um, Alan Wallace, it was, he says infirmary pose is like a wisdom pose. And so if there really is tension in your neck, I've had a herniated disc in my back so many times and having to practice lying down can be really great. So just as a, a and then with the practice of labeling and letting go, there's a lot of different instructions from different um, traditions. Um, you know, we have <clears throat> like Shinzen Young has this practice where he's really specific of just really naming the kind of sensory inputs. So if you're noticing kind of light behind your eyes, seeing, if it's like sensations, feeling, thinking, I like to get granular on my thoughts because I feel like it helps kind of boop, push them away. So I'll do something like worry, oh, worry, <laughs> worry. And then I find it kind of amusing, like just to notice that the content is so similar and often so I'm like, this will be back. So it's almost by like naming with specificity what's happening, we can kind of help reduce. But I do think the reason there's so many different instructions for labeling is because different things work for different people. And, but we don't really want to engage with it. 
Um, I also think it's not cheating at all if it's a thought, especially one that's like concerning, but also people can have really creative inspirations during practice. You could just write, you know, because then people are like, I'm not going to remember that thing. I got to remember that. I'm not going to, not a problem, you know? So if the level of the thought is like just pulling you out of the present, I would say also us, we couldn't do that here, but just in general. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Yeah. Geneva, you have a question for us. Um, I don't know if it's so much a question as a, or, yeah. a, a couple comments. Um, you were, you had talked about let, breathe your whole body. And that yeah. was just such an amazing sensation. Hmm. I'd never, it was like the cells breathing. It was just really beautiful. Thank you. Wonderful. It was like, oh, it's transformative. And then it was like my brain melted. It was like it liquefied. I could feel <laughs> it going down, just disappearing. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you asked us what did, you know, our intention when we come. That was a really fascinating question to ask why that we come. I went through a lot of different things with that. But I also think, you know, a lot of it's the practice, of course, but it's also intellectually stimulating. It's, it's interesting. <laughs> it's very thought provoking. Mm. You know, your, descri your descriptions are always great. Uh, mm. Thank you. And I'm going to let my whole body breathe from now on. Wonderful. So glad. Yeah. I'm at such a wonderful uh, insight or report. And I do think it's such a level of relaxation that we can be in when we can kind of feel our whole body. So I think often we think we're feeling our whole body, but we're actually thinking about our body. <laughs> you know, we're it's, not in our body. So, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. And would you mind if we? Thank you. <laughs> Just hold it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I. What did I? What was I gonna say? I forgot. Oh uh, yeah. I didn't notice. I just noticed when the zoom bomb thing happened that it was like I didn't find it very startling. I was. It was actually the first time I like felt very comfortable in the whole practice. Interesting. For some reason, I just mm. thought it was really funny. <laughs> and I guess I was feeling kind of serious or something. Yeah. And then I was like, and then I was able to be very present. Mm. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I guess that there's a lot of other things that I experienced. After mm. that, I felt like I felt then I then I noticed myself feeling like, oh, like like felt like shame because I was like, oh, <laughs> everyone's gonna think it's my fault because I think it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> but then I just kind of started letting that go and then I mm. settled back to kind of where I was before. Mm. I don't know. That's, that's about it. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up. I do think humor and laughter, you know, that is such a great way to get in, as they say, to our deeper channels, you know, to kind of, and to drop into the belly. Right. And when we're laughing, it is like Geneva was describing, it's our whole body. You know, we're not like, ha, 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 right? Like we're laughing through our whole body. And if um, if we thought it was funny, I mean, it, I had the startle response. And then, yeah, my first thoughts were like, oh my God, those guys got us so good. <laughs> like, that's so funny. I just imagine them seeing us and being like, yes. Um, but it is, you know, but I also, I did then feel worried. I was a little vigilant when I heard the door open and other things and, just noticing like our body's doing what it's supposed to do, right? Which is kind of get us um, alert. Yeah. Anyone else reflections on the practice or questions on the practice? 
Mace, come on up. In the Vajrayana practice that I've been taught, there's a practice where you do make a startling sound. Yes. Or some, you know, there's the like drop your hands on the legs, or there's a practice where you kind of yell out a syllable, mm -hmm. and then like there's like what's after that. So it was interesting because it happened like it was longer than obviously that practice. You know, that practice is sort of intentional. It was, but it was really kind of interesting that you brought us back to like what's now, right? And so one of the things that it did do, and I'm hearing from other folks, is that it did like bring it bring everything for me right back into my body so like, should we invite them every week <laughs> well and then i came running out and i looked and it did look like they had the little bear ears thing on going on did anyone else see that so that like made it extra you know when you can do the little thing on your zoom picture i think they had bear ears on so that made, <laughs> that made it extra funny um anyway. oh yeah there's a person there for sure it was I, what i saw was a person yeah but and i think they had barriers on yeah um, but anyways point is it like really did that kind yeah. of yeah so much startling that any of the whatever list i was making yeah which i was very involved <laughs> in a list um which i always am and uh the list was gone yeah yeah so i just sort of wanted to talk like we're in here sometimes studying uh tibetan buddhist books and yeah so we had a major tibetan buddhist practice there yep yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's, it's also nice. Um, I'm glad you point that out because it, it gives us an opportunity to do it in our, um, like our post meditation or everyday life. So I notice um, uh, after like, for example, big wave and I'm out there and I'm pushed under and then I come up for air. That moment is so clear and so bright and so present. Um, and so how can we use those kind of like a bit startling moments, um, not to close your eyes and be in practice. Cause if it's in the world, you need to like be aware and vigilant of what's happening. Um, but if you're safe enough to like use those, like those kind of cutting through moments in a way and just be with like the present and not be performing and not be planning and not be ruminating. It's really yeah. And it's really nice, again, to have the sense of the brightness. So we often say settling our mind into its natural state, the state of kind of clarity, like vibrance. And you're like, are you not talking about my mind? <laughs> my mind is busy or it's dull and that's it. Right. And so what does that vibrancy feel like in our mind? I think of it sometimes like when you're listening to music and it's so beautiful and it feels again like that music is just you know, filling your entire beingness and you're not dull and you're not distracted. So just finding those places throughout our day where we can have that sense of um, what part of our mind or awareness is like is very powerful. So I think there's a hand, is it Claudia? Hi, Claudia. Hi, Eve, how are you doing? Good, nice to see you. Likewise. I have a question. Before I, um, before the Zoom bonding, I was feeling kind of anxious and actually fear. And I guess I was debating whether should I like work through those feelings, mm -hmm. you know, and feel them or trying to reject them. And because they were kind of like negative, right? And so I just felt yeah. like, should I just like, I kept on, I started trying, telling myself, I'm safe, I'm fine, I'm, you know, I'm okay, mm -hmm. and whatever. And then the Zoom bombing made it worse because yeah, of course. it felt almost as if negative energy had been attracted, you know, and it yeah. really did startle me. And I, I, I had actually even almost like pain in my stomach, you know, it was, mm. so uh, it did help a lot to go back to the breathing and start breathing, going through those deep cycles of inhaling and exhaling and being really very mindful about them. Yeah. But what do you recommend? Like when, yeah. if I have the feelings like that, should I go through them or should I yeah. reject them, let go? Yeah. 
Yeah. Thank you for the for the question. I'm sure it resonates for so many people. And um, a couple of things I noticed, Claudia, and what you said was, you know, the kind of the worry or the anxiety and then kind of thinking through it, like, mm -hmm. right. And so we're kind of engaging with the content in a way that can sometimes amplify. Mm. And so, you know, you and I have done the handshake practice together a lot as, as some of us here in the Sangha, but that practice of really, instead of thinking through the challenge or difficulty that like what we did after essentially, which is kind of shake hands with what's here. Like, mm -hmm. what are the sensations mm -hmm. and creating this like um, sense that this this body is a body that can can hold it. Um, and this is tough, right? Because some some of us, some of the time, it can be really overwhelming, the feelings. And I would say, Claudia, you know, if you're on your own practicing and it's strong, get up and do walking. Mm -hmm. And let the movement also be just a way to be in the body. You know, because it's um, stillness, incomparably beautiful. Mm -hmm. I wish I was talking to a researcher earlier this week and I was like, can we just study stillness more? Because I do think there's just an incomparable benefit to being able to still our body and mind. And sometimes it's not the right medicine, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes there's too much um, that we need to work through and just the walking practice alone can really help. So I'd say if you want to keep sitting, maybe shake hands with the feeling. So do that embodied practice of just allowing, allowing, allowing no agenda, not pushing away, not talking to it, just allowing. Mm -hmm. And you could experiment with the walking. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Nice All to right. see you. you too. Okay. Any other thoughts? Yes, please. Oh yeah, where did the mic go? Oh, yeah, the talking, <laughs> you're so right. That's hilarious. <laughs> so for me, um, I, I, I startle easily in general. And so it was an interesting experience for me to, to observe what was happening in my body. You know, I, I, I live with anxiety. So those feelings were not completely new to me. Um, or even having mindfulness wasn't completely new to me. Uh, I think sitting with them literally was a little different. Mm. And when you talked about putting your hand on, you know, for me, because for me, I could feel it very, like a that tight adrenaline feeling. Well, I'm calling it adrenaline, but it was just like this tight burning feeling. Yeah. And my throat. Yeah. So I put one hand on my throat, one hand mm. on my stomach. And for me, I have this sort of fearful cynicism about doing things like that. Like, like for me, there's something kind of embarrassing about being the kind of person that that like jet that is gentle with themselves. Mm. You know, I have all sorts of like judgments about that and mm. people who do things like that. And at the same time. It was really helpful and it was a good <laughs> opportunity for me to just to kind of um, allow myself to do that in, in public. And the other thing I noticed was just, it's interesting that someone said that they saw one person because I saw a group of people. So like, who knows what was actually there? <laughs> but I noticed in my mind, I kept replaying that over and over and over yeah. again, hearing that music over and over and over again until eventually it, I eventually I did settle. Yeah. And I think that being in a room of people physically was helpful for that. Hmm. Wow. I would like to bow down to your reflection. Like truly so beautiful. Like just to like, offer that it's hard to be gentle like that's really I really appreciate it and it is it's hard for a lot of us to be gentle to ourselves and maybe we think we're being gentle but we're like yeah yeah that's that thing I'll do at the end of the day oh didn't have time right or like I don't want to be one of those people who does that kind of thing right whatever it is so yeah I just I really appreciate you sharing that and also that that it worked. <laughs> it's one thing to give it a try, um, but it's another thing to find like the causal efficacy, right? And that's, you know, what's 
Buddha's famous saying, come and see. Don't take my word for it. Come and see. Don't, don't let me tell you about my doctrine. Um, check it out. And, you know, there is some, some great science to back it up, right? Especially this release can give us a sense of oxytocin. So it really is that sense of being held and cared for. Um, so that it's, you know, if it's science back, then it might be tougher. We can also reframe it that way. But uh, yeah, thank you so much. And the re repetitive part too, like it's really interesting to see, you know, how long it takes us to come down physiologically, right? And to notice kind of like the, the tail of it, just when we're in practice and something arises, I mean, there was already enough with like the bus and the sirens, right? We can notice that reverberation in our body, but to have that kind of startle and then to be able to watch that it will come down on its own is very powerful. We know that even if we don't do anything, it will, we will recover. It's a really nice feeling, it gives us some confidence in our body's ability to, to be resilient. Thank you. Bill raised his hand. Okay. Hi there. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's nice to see you. Um, I know nice we've talked a lot you. about it, but in my preference would probably not to get Zoom bombed, you know, at all. <laughs> but if it is going to happen, I'm kind of glad it happened in our meditation because it was right. great practice. You know, you recovered yeah. real quickly, come back to your body. Here we are. And I realized that, you know, I didn't even really know what was going on until it was after that it even happened. Yeah. You know, I thought it was a loud radio or something at first, you know, I, uh, um, and then it's like, let go of that because it's not really important. It's not really significant. It's just something that happens, you know, and um, I'm just glad it happened while we were meditating. I thought it was good. Mm. <laughs> okay. So we have a lot of endorsements to invite these folks back. <laughs> No, 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 no guarantees. Just kidding. Just kidding. No, we, but thank you. And I appreciate that bill. And, and I do, I appreciate um, working with it, right? Like I came to teach this, but there was another teacher tonight, <laughs> you know, that I got a little upstaged and, or Shanti Deva got a little upstaged, but that's, that is. And I do think too, one thing I love about this center, right. Is that we're in it. We're not in our sweet, happy place far away. Like we're in it and there's like, it's annoying. And it's one thing to kind of have a sense that, yeah, I can do my practice anywhere, but to actually have to practice when there's sirens and, and cars and trucks, you know, it's really good practice. I joke that, um, that, you know, surfing in San Francisco is very good practice because it's like too cold, too big, rough and blown out. Like it's like the waves are bad very, very often, but it also makes you very like hearty. And I think that there's a quality of practicing like together and with a little bit of adversity that kind of can help us. So, yeah. How do you, it's kind of related because I, like I prefer practicing with some adversity just because there's more, there's just more happening. So like, Today I was trying to be in my body. Oh, it was coming. Like I have days where like sitting still feels like I'm crawling out of my skin. Mm. It's more like a sensory processing or a neurologic, not emotional. It's not anxiety. It's just I need to go like swing on the swing set or jump on the trampoline or like sitting still is not what my body needs to do. Yeah. So and that that was what I was working with today. So I was trying to figure out like when that happens is the right thing to do to like try to try to sit and be in stillness or is it to just go mindfully swing on the swing set like how do you yeah such a good question and it's like it's it's one thing if you're like wow today you know I am just so activated and this is really not working in my body but it's another thing if it's like every day or like you've already exercised, like I, I really like to sit after like a long walk in the city, you know, like going, like doing a loop a minute, not a minute, sorry, an hour, 45 minutes, then sitting. So I've had the movement, I've let my mind and body kind of connect because I'm 
like not listening to anything, just looking around and sit. Really find stillness. I also think it's hard for a lot of us engaged on screens and in like these, you know, mediated environments where we're kind of maybe multitasking. Um, that can really like make our ability to just be with ourselves harder. And that's why I do think going in through the body. But to answer your question, I think sometimes getting the movement out is great. And that might even be, you know, some yoga asana before like actual stretching sometimes like if we do too high activity it might get us all like too excited so it's I think we gotta um, kind of pay attention for ourselves of what's really working it could be just a little walking practice helps or I will even break up a practice walk sit walk sit in like a 45 minute practice I guess I'm saying there's no wrong way but I wouldn't all if you're feeling like you always have to like leave the room you might be missing something because there's a level of like discomfort that we push through to be in stillness that can be very instructive so yeah paul has his hand up hello hello there we are yeah i've been uh away from the Bay Area for about three years now. So I've been on a lot of Zoom calls. And that's the first time I've been bombed. And to me, it was just part of the practice. I mean, I'm <laughs> sitting here in my kitchen, the windows open. So I'm hearing traffic going by, the ceiling fans on. So there's a little hum. So I'm sitting here in my practice and it took actually a couple seconds for me to recognize what was going on. And it was like, oh, wow, that's new. And then it was gone and it was just back to practice. So it was, you know, another learning experience like everything else in the course mm. of a day, you know, is it's, it's an opportunity to live and learn and mm. pick something good out of it or just let it go and forget about it. So yeah. I know that mm. might sound a little contrarian to some of the other comments, but that's just the way it worked for me. Yeah. We are all unique and different responses, but yeah, thanks for sharing, Paul. So I am gonna give us a moment to do a little paramita. We might dip in tonight only to uh, the primary here or our first one. So the six paramitas that we're gonna be going through again, generosity, discipline, patience, joyful effort, mindfulness, and wisdom. One way to think about the paramitas are they're like our priorities. Like, what do we think matters? What are we putting first? What's like what we are like kind of inclining towards? And I think we can have, of course, other priorities really important, like getting fed, having the resources that we can have a home and connecting with people we care about, supporting others. But having these other aspects or qualities as priorities, it's it's such a like a wholesome and also reliable source of developing true sustained well-being. So I myself, I think I love going grocery shopping more than almost anything else. It makes me feel so secure. I'm like I have food. This is good. That's great. It supports my temporary well-being, but it's not like developing the true kind of practice of generosity which is an ongoing source of my well-being. So we'll start with generosity. I just really, um, I think it's such a beautiful, it's such a beautiful practice and there's so many dimensions. And one of the, one of which is that there's actually um, like generosity is the very foundation of how we start on our bodhisattva path. So the bodhisattva path, which is the path to dedicating waking up your heart and mind for the sake of all beings, that that is generous, right? That's a very generous um, aspiration and goal. And this generosity, especially as it's described in this, in this, whoops, in this book, um, there's actually three different types. And there's the generosity of kind of offering material things. There's generosity of offering something that someone needs to feel safe 
and then the generosity of supporting people to kind of learn the truth or the dharma or understand reality as it is and with these different types of generosity it's not just you know our benevolence and our goodwill which it is but our generosity it actually really helps us overcome our own selfishness and craving like when we're giving things away we're less likely to be so like afraid we're going to lose them or like want more or like i just want to give this my heart is of giving of this um i do want to read this passage because i think it's so beautifully written here mm -hmm. The inconceivable wish to help all sentient beings always begins with oneself. Our own experience is the only thing we have to share. Other than that, we can't pretend to be more awake or more compassionate than we actually are. Much of our realization comes from the honest recognition of our foibles. The inability to measure up to our own standards is decidedly humbling. It allows us to empathize with other people's difficulties and mistakes. Mm -hmm. In short, the best friend is one who realizes our sameness and is skilled in helping us help ourselves. So I love this idea that kind of actually that our generosity begins with us and our ability to have this kind of kindness, forgiveness, understanding that we make mistakes. And our ability to be kind to others has to be built from that. That's a really lovely um, way of kind of starting or establishing our generosity practice. And for many of us, it's a really hard place to start, right? It feels so nice to offer to others. For many of us, you know, that's just a sense of kind of reward. The people we care about, oh, we want to get them the nice foods they like or share things we think will make them happy. But this generosity towards ourselves, and really a generosity towards self, again, not just of the material things, but to be able to be honest and true and compassionate with where we aren't measuring up to the beingness of ourself we want to, which happens at least five a gazillion times a day, right? So I, I just really appreciate um, that gentleness. And I think, again, um, you know, this aspect of this aspect of this like insatiable craving, I just I find that um, I find that a really interesting piece. And, and Shanti Deva um, talks about this a lot. This is so Shanti Deva is an eighth century um, scholar, and he's really talking, you know, quite a lot about the different ways we need to abstain in order to wake up. And he says, uh, for beings long to free themselves from misery, but misery itself they follow and pursue. They long for joy, but in their ignorance, destroy it as they would a hated enemy. So this interesting idea that, that we long to free ourselves from misery, we actually pursue it. We want to feel joy, but accidentally we destroy it. And it's kind of this like heedless trampling, like, I just want to be happy. I just need to get this thing. I need to feel good. I get it. And instead of, oh, wow, like what's already around me? Or like, what can I freely offer that's right here? It's a really beautiful way. Like, I think the generosity, in, in especially in this context, isn't just what I can offer, but can I receive the generosity of what life is offering me? Right. And that's a really tough one um, to be with, because sometimes it doesn't feel um, and, and very realistically have a sense of being something we want, but receiving the generosity of life as it is. It's a total shift in the way that we see the world. Um, Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Pema Trojan says on this, um, we may assume we do crazy things intentionally, but in truth, we aren't, they aren't always volitional. Our conditioning is sometimes so deep, we cause harm without realizing it. We long for joy and do the very things that destroy our peace of mind. Again and again, we unwittingly make matters worse. If we're going to help other people get free, we have to work compassionately with our own unfortunate tendencies. 
Shanti Deva is an expert on dismantling these repeating patterns. So he he's he's very into um, you know he's really into kind of pointing out all these ways that we habitually catch ourselves up over and over. And it's interesting because I think this idea of of generosity it helps us with as Pema Chodron says later in the chapter with kind of the poverty mentality sometimes we experience in our mind, right? That there's not enough. I got to keep everything close. I need more. Such a different orientation, generosity. And with that understanding, it includes kindness and gratitude, right? It's this kind of virtuous cycle together. And as many of you know, there's pretty excellent research that that feeling of gratitude it's one of the key sources of our well-being and that when we feel gratitude, we're more likely to actually be kind towards others. So we do create that cycle for ourselves. So curious from folks, how does that land? How does this paramita of generosity, how could we include that more in how we act towards ourselves? Yes. A talking stick. <laughs> I think we should attach it to a stick. That would be funny. <laughs> or, or a ball. Just... Yeah, a little ball. <laughs> right. So uh, I'm just, I've been trying to lean into finding a way to be of service. Mm. And I think um, where is the balance between focusing on what you receive from life and how kind you are to yourself? with how much you actually give to others mm. so that's one part and the other one is like is it easier if you just focus on giving to others to not to just not be unkind to yourself because you're outside of your head <laughs> uh, such a good question i feel like i have this conversation with mace at least once a month uh, <laughs> You know, this idea, can we truly be compassionate to others if we aren't compassionate to ourselves? It's probably a researchable question. I don't think anyone has researched it. And I think, again, it's it's really useful for um, kind of the me search, the looking inward of if we are, as you said, like out of ourselves, like giving to others, then we're not so kind of neurotically preoccupied with our own shit, right? Feels pretty good but we're also not really like tending to our own heart and our own hearth. And that good feeling that we're kind of offering, it can sometimes we can overstretch what we have to offer. So I, I tell Mace this a lot. I, I think we can absolutely offer compassion in ways that we don't have it for ourselves authentically, but I think it drains us badly because we're not coming from a place where it's really forged here. That's my best understanding from my research, both you know, research is not conclusive, but from my own like examination and um, looking inward and kind of introspection. And then the other question, which is more um, like how, you know, what are the ways we can, how much do we experience generosity towards ourselves and, and kind of what the world is offering and then how much do we offer? I do think in this, again, a, a very common theme is how do we actually have engaged Buddhist practice? How does it leave these walls, right? It, it's really wonderful to engage here about the importance of universal compassion. How do we translate that? There's not a single answer, but I don't think it's a cop-out to say that we really can do it through body, speech, and mind. Right. So it's you can even have the action, you know, and go and spend your day um, working at a food bank or, um, you know, tutoring or finding a really way that's enriching, but it could be just relegated to that time. And you aren't sharing that same generosity with the people you live with or with, you know, with, those are the hardest people, believe me. But, you know with the other people in our lives. And so we really want to kind of saturate body, speech, and mind. Like, so it's so interesting. I'll just hint at our next paramita, which is discipline. And 
we would think like, oh, right, that's, I got to be serious. We got to do this. But the discipline is how deeply can we commit to not harming in our body, speech, and mind? How deeply can we have a sense of like, in, in, and not like we, I mean, you, you, you could, but not like you get so uptight and caught up that you're like, wow, I, I actually can't even like walk on the street because these little, like, like little things I can't even see. I might be stepping on. Like, you can get that level of granular, but it's more, can we really be clear on the harming we're doing? And when I first was working with this paramita of discipline, what I realized the most harm that I do on a day-to-day -day basis is rushing. Because when I'm rushing, I like miss tons of stuff. I miss someone who might be there like subtly or not subtly showing me they need my attention. I like miss on like what my actual body might need, like, you know, moving too fast and like bump myself or not nourishing myself. Eating over your keyboard doesn't count as nourishment. <laughs> I'm only half joking, but like how... <laughs> How do we like really commit to the non-harming through all things? And the paramitas are meant to be one by one. You know, they you can't start with discipline. You have to start with the generosity. Mm -hmm. So I think it's interesting, you know, how do we start with generosity, maybe even in a small way? And it is, you know, here suggested that it it has to be starting with ourselves. So how can we be? kind of more kind and more gentle with ourselves. And I feel like from that, it's like our readiness to be there for others. It's just there, you know, and it might, might be small, right? Like it might be just that again, you know, a colleague or friend or loved one, you know, is sharing something that's distressing. Like, oh, this is really hard for me right now. Maybe we can't fix it or do anything about it, but because we've been able to be generous with ourselves, we're more present and more caring. That's generous, right? Our time is really generous. It might be uh, volunteering at San Francisco Dharma Collective. Just kidding. <laughs> Though, of course, you can. Um, so there might be an actual thing we can do, um, or it might just be, again, this orientation of noticing how kind of giving ourselves that generosity opens us up to be generous exactly where it's needed without a lot of kind of premeditation on it. It's just like, it's just coming. And I noticed for myself, I mean, this is not just me. There's a really famous study. I think it's 1959, Darley and Batson. It's like foundational social psychology. And they, beautiful study. And I'm sure some of you know it. It's called the Good Samaritan Study. So they have these seminary students. So these are people who are practicing to become priests and you know, in the uh, order there. And they bring a bunch of them into this one hall. And they said, it, uh, sorry, bring them one by one into this like main teaching hall. And they said, yeah, you'll be giving a lecture on being a good Samaritan, being a good neighbor. Um, and it starts in about half an hour. It's only a 10 minute walk. So take your time to this other place. And for half of the group right so they had i think i can't remember how many people in each group they would tell them you have plenty of time take a walk no problem and the other people they'd say oh my god you're late you got to get there right now and give this talk and every single person who was given either either set of instructions walked down this little corridor past this courtyard into the teaching hall and they placed a person on the ground kind of like oh like moaning upset um, and the people who were running late, by and large, did not stop. The people who had enough time, they stopped, right? So just like the very way that we're ordering our lives and being generous can also make us more available for the calls that are there. Very long winding answer, I hope. Oh, okay. okay, good, 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 good. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions on that generosity? Yeah. I had a yeah. One thing I struggle. I, uh, part of my work involves dealing with um, trying to help homeless people, and I find that it's I struggle a lot with generosity around um, all of the states of dire need yeah. that so many of these people are living in, and how you know for me, like I can spend five bucks on a cup of tea and not even 
and just kind of take sip and throw it out and just kind of like, oh, I, you know, whatever, I'm, I'm able to do that for myself. Whereas I would feel like I'm really a big shot if I was getting a homeless person five right. dollars and stuff. Yeah. It feels like there's an egoist, there's a, there's a layer of generous action that's kind of wound up in my mind, at least with a sort of egotism, mm. and, you know, like, and then, I, it, and then along with that, it's sort of like, oh, I should be appreciated more. Or if I see that same person the next day, I think, how come they're not, you know, you know, there's just something I'm judgmental about it. Right. I find I have to, if I'm trying to be what I think is a truly generous, it almost feels like I have to find a way to do it anonymously. Anonymously. So that I can't, like, mm. find a way to, you know, have it stuck to myself. And yeah. Puff up this image I have of myself. Yeah. Yeah. And I also felt like that the one time recently, I have a member of my family who was having a difficult time. I feel like she's not using the resources that she has. So I'm all judgmental about all this kind of stuff. And there was a moment um, where I was able to sort of think, well, am I using all of the resources that I have? Mm. And of course I'm not because, you know, whatever. And so it felt like there was a moment where I was actually able to be actually generous yeah. and kind and clear that uh, I wasn't able to otherwise. Mm. So, I don't know, I just, the thoughts I had. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you for those reflections. I mean, both. Uh, I'd say I'll, I'll take the one you just mentioned first of finding generosity through compassion, right? And just being able to, you know, recognize that sometimes our, our judgment towards others and kind of like, why are they doing it like that? And that that's not the right way to do it. And being able to just sense like, wow, they're just like me. I also don't know how to do it sometimes. So generous, right? And and the way we do that with ourselves, right? Of, for me, very commonly, like, why did I do that? Why did I do it like that? And then everybody does it like that sometimes. Not to mean it's okay or we should never change or improve, but just that generosity of like, yeah, all of us right? That's the breaking down of the barriers. And then the egoic connection to our giving, you're very good noticing, you know, and I do think, you know, anonymous giving or selfless giving can be like really sweet. Um, and it can really kind of help with it. And you'll always hear fundraisers say like, give till it hurts a little. And you're like, oh, I don't like that, but I get it. Right. And it's how do we, um, how do we offer what is comfortable for us to offer and then like a tiny bit more. Um, and it, even though it feels good to give to others, like that's okay. We don't need to be martyrs and be like, Oh, I felt good about giving. It's not real giving. Right. I think that's, it's unrealistic. And there's a reason that we feel good about giving that has helped us as humans survive. That is how we are a social species makes sense. It feels good to give. So yeah, thank you. Wow. Let's take one moment to dedicate our merit, a rich evening. So just coming back into the body and breath. Noticing what maybe conversation and reflection has brought up in the body. And considering this time together with the teachings and one another, that there could be some benefit of being together, this merit. And as part of our practice, we dedicate this merit. Consider that if there's any good of what we have done here together, that we could offer it up. Offer it in this outrageous and essential wish that all beings could be free, that all beings could know belonging and love, all beings could connect to their essential joy. Thank you all so much. 
so great to be here next week we're gonna do like four paramitas so come on back i will be here hope to see you <laughs>